you think about your own life, what you're dealing with, what you're going through, we're ready for Easter. We're ready for Easter people. And this morning, we're going to get our hearts ready, if they're not already ready for Easter. Uh, yesterday, we, we said goodbye uh, to uh, a loved one, uh, Elia's grandmother, 91 years old, Kathy Zeitler, went to be with the Lord. Uh, Kathy, just a wonderful, wonderful lady. She was my nanny. Uh, she was my nanny. She was one of those kind of people that just welcomed you in no matter who you were. You were family. She taught about Jesus. And so we're going to formally celebrate her life this week. But as I think about Easter and I think about hope and I think about being prepared, I think about, I think about Elia's grandmother. I think about Kathy, Kathy Zeitler. You see, Palm Sunday makes us think about preparation and being ready. Palm Sunday makes us think about the kind of Jesus that we welcome, the kind of Jesus that we welcome. As Christy mentioned, the crowds were chanting, Hosanna. The crowds thought they were ready, <laughs> but it's, it was probably some of these same people that just a few days later were shouting, crucify him. They weren't ready to welcome Jesus on Jesus' terms. And it makes us think about our own lives and about if we're ever like that as well. Do we welcome Jesus? Do we ready our hearts? Do we prepare our hearts for Jesus on his terms? Or on our terms? What Jesus do you welcome? Do you welcome the Jesus we see revealed in the scripture in the New Testament? Are we worshiping just an image we've created of him in our own mind? Are we, are we really ready for what Jesus brings to us? You see, Jesus would come, and he would indeed save his people. But he would save them in a way that no one expected. They expected someone to come in and give Rome the boot. Jesus came to give sin the boot. He came to give death the boot. Why would Jesus have to go through all this? Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read Romans chapter 7, because as we think about readying our hearts, as we think about celebrating the supper of our Lord, we want to be a people who welcome Jesus on his terms. Paul said this, why Jesus had to come? Paul said, Paul, who wrote the majority of our New Testament, said, for I do not understand my own actions. He said, for, for I, I, not, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Can you relate? He said, now if I do what I want, do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this, bloody, from this body of death? Maybe you're asking that question this morning, thinking about your own life. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul says, verse 25, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our deliverance. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? It comes from the Lord. It comes from what Jesus would do this holy week. And so... Maybe you find yourself a little bit like Paul. Can you relate to that at all? I can. Maybe you find yourself able to relate to Paul. I, I keep doing the things I know I shouldn't do. I don't understand all the time what I do. Sometimes I find myself doing the very things that I hate doing. 
I dwell on what's not right. I, I don't treat people the way I'm supposed to treat people. I, I seek life outside of Christ. You ever seek life outside of Christ? Do you welcome things into your own heart and mind, into your own body, that you know are destroying relationship with God, self, neighbor? You see, we need to understand the struggle with sin, and Paul's trying to explain that complicated relationship we have with sin, that, that we find ourselves welcoming things into our life that are just not right for us, and we all do it. We can point the finger at other people, but that's not the point. The point is to open up our own hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to, to wash us and to make us clean and to get us ready because Paul's, Paul's reminding us that, hey, sin has a grip. Sin has a grip on our lives. It, it leads us astray, and sin has that power to keep us from doing the good that we, we know we ought to do. And, and like Paul, we find ourselves sometimes doing the very things that we hate and failing to do the good that we desire. And sometimes our journey with Jesus will include setbacks. And some of you come this morning and you're saying, Pastor, my life has been set back. Maybe, maybe some of my own actions, maybe actions of other people. But as we come to the table of our Lord, around the table of our Lord, you see, we're challenged to tell the truth about ourselves. I know in our world, image management, controlling the narrative, relativism, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person over there, so... Man, around the table of our Lord, we're honest. We're honest. Where have our actions set us back from loving God and loving neighbor? Where are we seeking life outside of Christ? Are we, are we welcoming things into our hearts and into our minds that do not honor our, our Lord? Are we welcoming Jesus, the Jesus who was crucified, the Jesus who rose up from the dead, or are we worshiping some other kind of, of self-help Jesus? What Jesus are we welcoming in? You see, the Bible says that, that we all sin and, and we're all separated, and that's why Jesus would have to go to the cross. And so when we find ourselves doing the things we don't want to do and not doing the things we know we should, Paul is pointing us back to Jesus. Where is our hope? Where is our deliverer? Where is the good news? It's in Jesus Christ. It's what he did for you and for me, that we remember his life, his death, his resurrection for the forgiveness of sin. Where else would we go? Where else could we go? What are you welcoming in your own life? Where are you seeking life outside of Christ? This morning, this morning, will you tell the truth? Paul's telling the truth. It's right here in Scripture. It's in black and white. He's telling the truth about himself. And in our world, we, we sometimes have a hard time telling the truth. We tell the truth about the things you welcome into your life that don't honor our Lord, that don't love your neighbor as yourself. You see, Holy Week reminds us what we're going to celebrate next week, next Sunday morning when we have Easter, is that the key to God's future has already been displayed. And that display happened in Jesus Christ. That, that you and me, we have been delivered from sin. You, you see, grace is a scandal. Let me tell you about the scandal of, of grace. As a scandal, let me give you a definition, is a, is a circumstance or action that offends propriety or established moral uh, conceptions or a scandal disgraces those associated with it. You see, the scandal of God's grace is that no matter what you have welcomed into your life, no matter how shameful, no matter how bad, no matter how wrong it is, no matter how it hurt you, no matter how it hurt someone else, the scandal of God's grace is that Jesus came for you to forgive you. He came to redeem you. He came to restore you. Our, our world is going to cancel. Our world is going to cut off. Jesus came to bring you back. Jesus came to welcome you in to the Father's family. It's a scandal. It offends. But we must embrace the scandalous truth that God forgives all kinds of people. Even people that you and me wouldn't forgive. 
God forgives them too. The scandal of grace. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, we read this. Anyone who claims to be in the light, walking with Jesus, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. The scandal of grace is that God, if God has forgiven us, then we go and, and we forgive other people. Because one of the scandalous fallouts of God's grace is that God forgives all kinds of people that you and me wouldn't forgive. Anne Lamott says, Earth is forgiveness school. C.S. Lewis writes, Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. As we think about what we welcome into our lives and hearts, maybe some of us are welcoming bitterness, some of us are welcoming anger. Maybe some of us are welcoming rage. Maybe some of us are welcoming revenge. Jesus died for them too. Truth is, sometimes we hurt other people. Sometimes we ourselves are hurt. John also will tell us that he died for our sin, but he says in 1 John 2 too, he says, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He died for them as well. He died for the whole world. You see, what makes forgiveness of God is that even though we know what happened, even though we remember, we still offer pardon because there are things we shouldn't forget. But forgiveness means I no longer carry the weight of seeking revenge. We can forgive people. We can still report a crime. We can forgive people and still seek justice. We can forgive people and still seek restitution and restoration. We can forgive people and still lament the devastation that the action caused. But if God has forgiven you, even when you find yourself like Paul, doing the things you don't want to do, failing to do the things you know you should do, disappointed in yourself, if God has forgiven you when you continue to sin, and you don't forgive other people? You, you see, that shouldn't be. So, so this morning, would we welcome the grace of Jesus for us and for them? Would you welcome the grace of Jesus for you? Would you welcome the grace of Jesus for your neighbor, for the person that has hurt you, for the person that has done you wrong? You see, Jesus died the death that was the reward for our, our sin. And if God can reconcile with a sinner, surely you can reconcile with a saint. If God can reconcile with a sinner, church, surely you and me can reconcile with a saint. Is there something you need to let go of today? Is there someone that you need to reconcile with? As far as it depends on you, doesn't mean they will. But Paul says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And maybe there's been some things, as far as it depends on you, that you haven't been doing. Would you welcome the grace of Jesus for you and for them today? You, you see, you don't have to keep paying the debt that you can embrace Forgiveness, it doesn't mean we excuse wrongdoing, but it means releasing the burden of seeking revenge and embracing a path of reconciliation and justice and restoration. And so uh, this morning, as we celebrate the supper of our Lord, we've been adopted into the family of God by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on our behalf. And so today, we're going to dine together as a church family at Jesus' table it's Jesus' table. But I think it's important that as we come to Jesus' table, we tell the truth. So this, this time before our deacons get up and begin to serve the Lord's Supper, before they begin to move, I just want us to pause and to be still and have a moment where you tell the truth about your life to the Lord and a moment where you receive and you say, Lord, I, I'm your servant. I'm here to listen. I want to hear. 
I want to hear, Lord, what you have to say. I want to, I want to hear the truth about myself, and I also want to hear, I need to hear those words of grace and forgiveness. So right where we are, just before we have any movement, there's something I'm feeling led to do right now. Let's just take a moment, bow our heads, close our eyes, and prepare our hearts for what we're about to do. Lord, thank you for the welcome that we have received into your family as believers. Forgive us for the way we act. Lord, this morning we come to remember your life, your death, your resurrection for the forgiveness of sin. And we come to welcome you on your terms, not on ours. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'm now going to ask our deacons to begin preparing the Lord's Supper. Paul said some really important words about this meal that we're sharing together. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said... For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, he said, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. How many sermons are we having today at Pioneer Drive? Hundreds. Thousands. You see, Christ came to give his life for us. You're going to preach a sermon, and this is what you're saying, that that Christ came to give his life for us, that, that, that he received what he did not deserve. And so this is a time for us to be put back together. It's a time for us to be mindful that we have been made whole in Jesus to remember that we are forgiven and that we are loved. Jesus came to redeem and to restore and reconcile what our sin, what my sin has broken. So this is a powerful symbol, a meaningful reminder. And... There's different ways of doing the Lord's Supper and um, within the church, the, local, the global church. One of the ways we do that here at Pioneer Drive and Celebration Worship is, is the bread and the juice are passed from one to another, and it's something that we receive. That you don't have to get up and come forward, and there's a powerful symbol in that as well. But today, the way we do it, you receive it. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to earn it. It's a gift that comes to you and that you turn and you also share forgiveness and grace with the people around you. So this is a family meal. Family meal. It's for those who want to remember the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. This morning you may just say, Pastor, there's... And and you don't owe me an explanation. This is between you and the Lord. You may say there's just, for whatever reason, I don't feel like I should participate today. That's between you and the Lord. But let me also just say, the the Lord's Supper is not for perfect people. It's for hungry people. People who are ready to welcome Jesus and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness that he offers to you He offers to me. So here in a few moments, I'm going to read scripture and pray. We'll read, receive the bread, then we'll receive the cup. But we do it all to remember Jesus. That's why we do it. Jesus gave his disciples, and he gave you and me a meal to remember him. You know, some people drink to forget But as believers, we drink to remember. We drink this morning to remember what our Lord has done for us. The Lord's Supper, this table, symbolically, is where we are fed. It's where we are nurtured. 
And as I think about my own life and as I think about what we read from Romans 7, there, there are so many ways we try to feed our soul on what is not good. And this morning, we feed our soul. We welcome Jesus on his terms into our life, into our body, into our soul. To be reminded that we are made clean and that we are healed and that we are forgiven. Will you welcome Jesus in? Will you welcome Jesus in? We remember his life, his death, his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sin. Here in just a moment, our deacons are gonna distribute, distribute the elements. Deacons, as you are ready, you may now distribute the supper of our Lord. Luke gives an account of this meal. He says in chapter 22, he says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So after taking the cup, he gave, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On your drive, church family, 
body of Jesus given for you and for me. We take, eat, and remember. Our deacons will now distribute the cup of our Lord. Luke tells us in verse 20, he says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The blood of Christ poured out for you and for me. We drink to remember Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you that you gave us this powerful symbol as a meal to remember what you did for us on our behalf. And this week, Lord, as we celebrate Holy Week, we're reminded that the gift of our salvation, our eternal hope, 
our promised inheritance. It wasn't free. It's free to us, but not to you. It cost you your very life. So we remember, as we begin Holy Week, we remember. And we welcome you in this week, Lord. Whatever you will, whatever is your way, may your perfect will have sway in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.